everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome the uh, committee and members of the public to this meeting of the London Assembly Housing Committee. Uh, the main item for discussion today will be property guardianship in London. Members of the public can uh, follow the meeting on the webcast and on Twitter, and if you can use the hashtags Assembly Housing and Property Guardian uh, for that, then we can join the discussion. Can I remind uh, members, guests and the audience to turn your phones off and put them on silent? And have we received any apologies for this meeting? We've received apologies from Assembly Member Leonie Cooper and uh, apologies for lateness from Assembly Member Nikki Gatbon. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to item two on the agenda, uh, this is declaration of interest. Can I ask members to note the list of offices on the report and ask if you have any additional interest to declare? No, thank you very much. Um, item three is the minutes of previous meetings. Uh, we have two sets of minutes uh, in the agenda papers. Can I ask uh, the committee to confirm the minutes of the meetings of the Housing Committee held on the 27th of June and the 4th of July 2017 to be signed by me as a correct record? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, the summary list of actions is item four on the agenda. Can I ask members to note the completed and outstanding actions arising from previous meetings? Thank you. Uh, which takes us to our, our main item, um, which is a discussion on property guardianship in London. Um, can I ask members to agree the focus of the discussion today? This is to identify the extent of property guardianship in London, highlight good and bad practice and emerging self-regulation in the sector, to examine the impact of property guardianship on Londoners, including local authorities, communities, businesses and property security companies, and to consider the effectiveness of current legislation and whether it protects guardians adequately. Thank you very much. And can I now welcome our guests? Um, we have uh, Professor Caroline Hunter and Jed Mears. They are from the University of York and they are carrying out some research on behalf of the committee. We have Lord Kennedy of Southwark, who is the shadow spokesperson for communities and local government, housing and home affairs. Uh, and you're the opposition whip in the Lords. Thank you for coming. Uh, we have Rubina Nisa. Thank you. Uh, she is the Valuation and Strategic Assets Officer from the London Borough of Lambeth. And we have John Castine, who is the Environmental and Environmental Health Officer from Westminster City Council. Uh, finally, we have Stuart Woolgar, who is a representative of the BSIA Vacant Property Protection Section, which is the security industry, which is where this falls under, and you're a director of Global Guardians, a guardian company as well. So thank you all for coming very much. Um, our questions, we wanted to start with um, Professor Hunter and uh, Jed Mears. Um, you're doing a piece of research for the committee. You don't have findings yet, but if you can outline what you're looking at in brief and what sort of findings you'll, you'll be bringing to the investigation. Yeah, shall I kick off then? Yeah. So um, what we're planning to do is basically in three different elements. So what we've kicked off so far is a property guardian survey focused on uh, property guardians living in London. And the idea is to look at a few things really. Firstly, demographics and descriptors. So not just things like income, occupation, ethnic status, but other things that we're particularly interested in. So disability, for instance, we don't know the extent to which property guardians have disabilities or otherwise a relationship status, whether their partners live in the property with them, all of those sorts of things. So that's the first chunk. Then how entry into property guardianship, what tenor they came from, whether they've been uh, within the sector for quite a long period of time, those sorts of issues. Asking about their current accommodation and property standards in particular they're interested in, down to the granular kind of details of how many kitchens they have access to, whether they have shared bathroom facilities, what sort of standards of repair uh, the uh, accommodations in and a lot of those questions we've taken from the English housing survey so we have a point of comparison uh, with general data about the private rented sector and then we're interested in the license agreements themselves so things like taking deposits any fees they've had to pay uh, extra fees for things like fire safety packs where they've had to pay those themselves if there's any condition specifically in the agreement or anything about the agreement they want to tell us about notice periods all of that sort of stuff as well we then have a few broader questions in there about why they wanted to enter the sector, um, their experiences with the property guardian company, and a third section as well on if they've made any complaints, um, say outside to local authorities or contacted a Citizens Advice Bureau or so on. Not everyone will be able to answer that, but we're interested in circumstances if they have, whether they have. So that's sort of the first chunk. So very briefly on the other two chunks is a, um, a mapping which we've done before 
of um, advertisements available in London uh, for property ownership companies. It's a bit of a, it's not a perfect tool, but the idea is to give an indication of what's currently available if you were to Google trying to find a property guardian property. And we're doing that over the course of this month. And the final strand of it is a very small scale um, telephone survey with uh, EHOs or other people responsible for similar functions across London local authorities. So those are the three sort of areas. The biggest part of that is the survey itself, uh, and that's currently underway. We've already been getting responses through to that, uh, and that will be open for the rest of this month. So people can still sign up to do yeah, the people survey? People absolutely can, yeah. PropertyGuardianResearch.co.uk, if anyone wants to have a look at that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's, that's a really comprehensive piece of research. <laughs> is it, is it, has it been done before? Is this a new...? No, this is new as far as... There's quite a lot of research happening with Property Guardians on a smaller scale. We've done some previous work before on a much smaller scale, which has been surveys with uh, EHOs, small-scale small, small scale survey with EHOs and local authorities. Uh, we've done a small forum piece of research with Property Guardians, uh, with Property Guardians UK, um, RHG Environmental, and the Empty Homes Network, uh, which had, only had about 36, I think, altogether Property Guardians participating, looking at similar questions, but on a far smaller scale and UK-wide. And we've done the advertisement mapping before um, across the UK. So we just took a couple of months ran weekly minings of the adverts available online and plotted them on a map and saw what came out. And what we saw was there's different pockets across the UK, particularly in London, um, Manchester, areas outside Liverpool and Birmingham, but there no, doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to the pattern. So we've done bits of this before, but this is, I think, the, most, the biggest try at doing something a bit, more, um, a bit more scalable and that should give us a bit of a better idea about incidents and, um, uh, and other things like license agreements and uh, fees and otherwise in the sector. Okay, thank you very much. And this will be published presumably alongside our... That's right. So we'll be doing report. an interim report um, in the first week of October and then a fuller report after that. Great. Um, this is obviously not everybody knows what a property guardian is. So my next question is, um, can you give us the basics on this, yeah. essentially? Can you outline the 101 and then pass over to the yeah. professor to do the? If you could outline what it is in, in, in <laughs> yeah. legal terms, how the rights differ to normal tenants, what protections yeah. they have, that sort of thing. On a basic level, and I could pass over to Caroline, who could give you the um, more in-depth bits on it. It's sort of housing law 101 in a way, and a distinction between a lease and a license. Um, and it's about street and mount, but there are three key conditions for our purposes, really. The first is there's got to be a term, there's got to be rent, and uh, there's got to be exclusive possession. We know property guardians pay rent. They often pay it monthly, so you've got your term. So the issue is the exclusive possession. So that's the point of distinction between property guardians and um, tenancies, uh, per se. The exclusive possession issue is complicated because a lot of the time property guardians may get a key for their own individual room, in which case there probably is exclusive possession. Um, but if there's agreements, for instance, which allow property guardians to be moved by the uh, property guardian company quite often, or there's a lot of random inspections, those sorts of things, that could potentially play into the determination of the licence. So it's exclusive possession that's the key issue. The important point to underscore is it's not what's in the licence agreement that's necessarily important. It what it's what happens in actual practice. So there's a, the famous line from Street and Mountford, which is one of, the, one of the key cases in this area, is that if a manufacturer creates a four-pronged instrument for digging. It's a fork, whether or not they call it a spade. So it's what actually happens in actuality within the property that matters, not what's necessarily the property guardian signed. So that's the briefest overview. It's a distinction between a license agreement and a tenancy. And essentially, the difference then becomes, if it's a tenancy, it'll fall under the Housing Act 1988. And if not, essentially, the the, if it's a license, then the rights are much limited, more limited. But there are some light, um, rights, largely under the Protection from Eviction Act 1977. And essentially that means that at least they should get four weeks notice. And if they want to stay, they have the right to stay until there's a, a court order. We um, have a sense from some of our other research and some of the discussions we've had that um, a number of property guardians are not getting that notice period that, that you just mentioned. Do you have a sense from your research so far of, of what proportion are being evicted illegally under those terms? From our limited, so from the survey based, uh, the forum based research, um, we have very limited evidence of that actually. 
Um, but that's off a very small number of cases. That's off 36 people or so. We find in some cases, uh, even when there's a two-week notice period written into the licence agreement, property guarding companies are actually giving more notice than that two weeks. But as I say, that's, we, 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 anecdotally, we know that's happening. We just haven't, we haven't picked that up uh, in, our own evidence, in our own research yet. Okay. I, I think the, you, the starting point is the licence and what that says, and it should be more than two weeks. And certainly we have seen a change over time, I think, where many started with just two weeks and have moved to four weeks, but I'm not sure what we don't know is if it's all the firms or some of them that have made that change. The, the other important question which we'll be hoping to look at in the survey as well is where they move to, because there's quite a big, uh, there's an issue, if they're moving on to an alternate property guarding company, then there's internal churn within the sector rather than them moving on to become homeless, if you see what I mean. So um, that's also an important issue with the notice periods. But you've noticed that they're basically, they're increasing over time. So this indicates that the property guardian companies themselves are becoming more aware of the law. I would say yeah. so, yes. Okay, useful to know. Um, one of the other things that we've noticed people commenting on or suggesting is, is a problem is sort of gagging clauses within within the license agreements <laughs> yeah. um, that say they're not allowed to s sort of speak yeah. about. Is that common? Are you noticing problems with that? I don't know whether it's uh, common or not, so we haven't got any evidence one way or the other, I think, whether lots of the firms <coughs> are using it or not. Um, I'm not quite sure why they would put it in. Um, I think there may be issues legally about whether it's enforceable <coughs> or not, but there, there are no cases, so it's impossible to know. But I think there are there's a case that could be made that it, it's not um, a reasonable clause, um, whether you're thinking about under the Consumer Rights Act, potentially, or Article 10 of the um, Human Rights Act, but it, none of this has been challenged, so we just don't know legally whether, it, whether it's enforceable or not. Right, okay, that's, that's really interesting. Um, I think we, we should move on yeah. to more questions about eviction. Can, can I just, uh, just go back on what Mr Mears was saying? Does the fact that they are guarding properties have any legal recognition whatsoever when you're, when you're taking into account whether or not it's a tenancy or a license? Uh, no. None at all. I, it, the, I mean, I guess the one, I guess one arrangement you could say is if there was employed staff within the property itself, yeah. maybe that could prove a point of distinction um, between yeah. a lease and a license. But otherwise, it's... So no if duties they're off by, No, so if we look, what we're looking at is those key points of distinction. So the rent, whether it's for a term, and exclusive possession. That, that's what matters. If it's provided for employment, um, there, that's in street amounts as well. But I think in this sort of case, it wouldn't be, not, not in the circumstances of a uh, property garden. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Waldrop, um, we, uh, dis you know, despite it being illegal to, to evict a property uh, guardian with, within the 28 days of notice, we, we have heard some evidence from property guardians that they've been given notice of as little as a week uh, to vacate property. Um, do you accept that property guardians are at risk from illegal ev evictions? Um, yeah, I mean, when, uh, the reason why I joined the SBSIA um, to create the, the code of practice was to create the minimum standards. Um, and my, my company, the Global Guardians, we um, sought legal advice before we even started, and it was 20, clear 28 days notice. Um, but unfortunately in the industry there are some companies who do, who do not operate within 28 days. Um, we have been made aware of it because as a company we get the guardians from those companies come to us and tell us their stories obviously. Um, but the way majority of the companies now, because when we first started it was in 2011 um, and at the time everyone was doing one week, two week, all these kind of notice periods um, and then when it got confirmed to us about the Protection from Eviction Act 1977 immediately we changed so it was 28 days. Um, and over probably the last five years, I'd say the majority of the companies are doing 28 days, but there are still companies we hear that do less than that. And in fact, there is one, com one company we know of, um, he did three days' notice in order to win a contract, um, and it was a property that we were looking after, 
um, which we gave, we were given notice on, and the client wanted to, on a shorter notice period, which we didn't agree to, so there's 28 days notice, we warned the guardians, etc. But at the moment, that property is now with another provider who have given them three days notice as a, as a contract. Three days? It's in their contract, yeah, so it's... Um, is it legal for it to be in the contract? No. no. Um, could, a, could a minimum license period be introduced to offer guardians more security? I mean, effectively, um, it's kind of 28 days already, isn't it? So. Yeah, I mean, it, it should always be 28 days. I mean, we do 32 days because um, what we're trying to do is make sure that when we receive notice from a client, we can also make sure that it get hand-delivered and the guardians actually know. Um, sometimes we give longer notice periods if we're told up front by a client, okay, in two months the building's going to go back to becoming a flat or so, you know, whatever. Um, and I think the long, you know, because you do know, you do get a sense from the client when they need their building back, um, regardless of who, which company it is, the client will tell you, okay, we know it's going to be around this kind of time, so prepare your guardians. So you can always give that information. But in the licence agreement, it should be a minimum of 28 days. Thank you very much. Um, Lord, Lord Kennedy, um, you, you've uh, submitted uh, some suggestions about how the law could be changed, or uh, I, I wondered how you thought that property, um, property guardians could be protected from these <coughs> summary issues. Well, this whole area really come come to notice it, it, when we were in the law. We were discussing the Housing and Planning Act, and we were shocked then in the debates to see how little protection uh, property guardians actually have. So, either, uh, and it may well be we should be looking at things like what protections are in the private rented sector now, and what can easily be moved across, maybe through secondary legislation, to give further protections to people. But it just it seems, it seems to me that there was. I'm sure very reputable companies working in, in this sector to do, do things properly, but, uh, but then as we've heard in evidence, we've heard you know, people just not to do what they should be doing. I mean, three days notice, and I think it's totally unacceptable for anybody to be treated like that. So I think we should be looking to what, what's in the private sector now and what can we move across very quickly, maybe in terms of, private, in terms of secondary legislation possibly, or also equally what uh, local government can do. Uh, many, of course, these property guardians of properties are actually local authority properties. So again, local authorities themselves should, should make sure that the companies they actually uh, engage to uh, do these services for them adhere to the highest standards. I was pleased to see, of course, that there's a code of conduct now, or whatever, ad hoc. That's progress in the right direction. But I also think we need to see a, a, a gold standard to kind of rise everybody up. And certainly when the public is involved, they should be, should be leading the way on that. Isn't this one of these situations where the, the, the legal powers are already there? We've heard that it's illegal to evict somebody under 28 days anyway. Is it just a case that that law is not being enforced, or is there does additional legislation? Uh, is additional legislation required? Well, it, it may well be both. I mean, in some cases, the, the law may well be there, and it's the question for authorities to actually enforce that, of course. But as, you, as we all know, of course, is that under many, many pressures they are to deliver reducing budgets and, the, and problems. But others so they won't be there, don't have the protections. Uh, and I think so think that we should be looking at what can quickly be amended in terms of secondary legislation, uh, things that are protected already there for the private sector. Can they move the cross? Because they can get through Parliament very, very quickly. Have you got any specific ideas about what, what can be moved across, what particular measures might? Well, I, I just think we need to, I, I would throw stuff around sort of basic, you know, fit for human habitation, environmental standards. I mean, that's why I think we need to be moving across because people are living, living in these properties, uh, living in substandard accommodation where you haven't got proper washing facilities and you're, you know, living in windowless rooms. It's just not good enough. So I think we should be, in terms of looking at that, sort of, sort of the environmental protections, things that the environmental health, health officer would always be doing now in, in, in terms of, to look at those things and can they move across very quickly? Again, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sort of going over the same yeah. <laughs> area, but it seems to me that, that that those protections are already there but not being enforced. And if we just add another law, that's another law for local authorities to ignore, isn't it? Or another regulation for them to well, ignore. If they're well, not doing their job now, what makes you think they're going to do their job with even more regulation? Well, I think. 
I think what we need to do is see where they are not there already, and if we were to increase that, then equally working with the association, uh, look to increase the um, the sort of the the, the protection of the, of, the, of the gold standard. Really, mm. I think we've begun to see in the sector with I think it was ad hoc was it that actually uh, put forward their um, their uh, their suggestions about what, how they would treat their uh, people in, in their properties, and that's a start. Uh, it's not perfect because, of course, again, a lot of it talks about how we will treat you and stuff, but we also need to have to make what, what are your rights and be, so, that, so that the actual people in the properties are fully conversant of what their rights are and how they can enforce them themselves as well. That isn't very clear on anything I've seen. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Woolgo, just, just pick, pick up on that. Uh, uh, do, you, do you think a, a additional regulation may be helpful to you? An additional regulation. Ad additional regulation in the, um, in the well, sector. My, my opinion on it is that, as in the um, security industry as a whole, we had security guards, and a long time ago they were kind of unregulated and got away with lots of different things. Then the SIA came in and actually regulated the whole industry, um, and it's actually improved, and everyone's making um, much more progress. But I think if you had the same situation with the Guardian uh, model with the BSIA to regulate and then the companies, so for instance, like a gold standard, if, if that is the gold standard, <coughs> the BSI then regulates the industry with assistance, um, then all the things such as environmental health, um, you know, protection from eviction and so on, that could then be monitored by the external body to make sure all the Guardian companies are compliant. Because um, once that agreement's in place, then anyone who's outside of it, that the law can easily be enforced upon them. And I think what's happening is that a lot of the Guardian companies, because they're not under that regulation, um, they kind of try and get away with things which you shouldn't be getting away with, such as um, substandard accommodation and, and breaking the law. And the legal forgive me, and it's a, it's a point I'm constantly misunderstanding here. The regulation is already there. Yeah. So when they don't comply with the regulation, they're breaking the law. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have some questions now from Tom. Uh, Thank you very much. Yes. Um, I'm coming to um, uh, Rubina uh, first. Um, we've heard that local authorities make up a large proportion uh, of um, <coughs> some property guardians' businesses. What are, the, what are the positives and negatives in terms of uh, a local uh, authority of using property gardens to protect property? And what other options do you have? Okay, um, primarily, from a local authority point of view, our role is to protect buildings that obviously public owned buildings from squatting and vandalism. With residential property, the law is very clear that it's illegal to squat into a residential property. So if we know residential property is empty, we we'll just board it up or steal it and then we'll obviously approach guardians and do it in a more timely manner. When we know it's a commercial property, because we hold several properties that are in regeneration schemes and that takes time the regeneration can happen 18 months, sometimes two years. We can't all, our, our ideal option is to let it out on a commercial tenancy where there is regularity of income, okay? In certain conditions, that can't be done. So the alternative is we'll approach well-established property guardians companies who we have worked with and we know their response rates, we know the level of standards that they have, and they will always come and inspect your property and ask for a lot of like certification. So they are to ensure that the buildings are statutory compliant, because from their point of view, they have a duty of care to their guardian. They don't do overcrowding. Some, I mean, one property we spent about 10,000 putting in, it was a school building, earmarked for demolition in about two years. It's only like about 10, 15 years old. So it's quite a new building. Again, even there, we had new kitchens, we had that, we had energy efficient lighting, so it was done. In some cases, because the only money that we make from these buildings is not for the council's pocket, it's to cover the holding costs. We still have to pay business rates, we have to pay insurance, and that's where the money goes to. So it's a covering cost. Uh, so in, in terms of your, let's take your, um uh, residential property first, and so let's say you have you're, you're you're going to be demolishing perhaps uh, an estate as part of a regeneration scheme. Yeah. 
would you have property guardians in there or would you have people on a short short hold tenancies maybe on a, on a sort of six months to a year basis if we have properties in a residential estate and they're in good condition then our first duty would be to put temporary housing in there because we have a lot of homeless people that is blanket but in all I think in our council that's a first choice if a building does not meet because we have nothing known as Lambeth decent home standards mm. If the flat is in not such a good condition then and it doesn't meet the standards for homeless people, then we would look at guardian companies because they have a different set of standards, all right? Then we would look at guardians. We can't do assured short or tenancies because local authorities are not, not legally allowed to do them. Right. So, um, and in terms of the different... In terms of the different... Standards, I mean, it'd be a, mu a much lower standard, of course, yeah. for, for, for people going in on a property on a property guardian basis rather than uh, if you were putting, um, housing people temporarily in there. Yeah. Um, a different, well, but for temporary housing, sometimes we have to put, like, new cookers, new mm. worktops, new wiring, or the certification. With the property gardens, they will come in and do the checks to make sure it's self safe on health and safety mm -hmm. grounds, but we wouldn't have to rewire it or uh, bring it up to you know 2017 standards. So as long as it's legal and it's and it's no, there's no what. So as long as it's not dangerous. That's right. Yes, dangerous. Yes. Yeah. Right. And in terms of your non-residential property, let's say the, um, a school, for example, I mean, what 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 are the say from your perspective the benefits of, of using property guardians rather than say trying to maybe bring it into use temporarily for community purposes or something like that we do we in some cases we do bring it in for a community purposes we let them out to community groups if it's for a short term yeah uh, one um, difficulty we have had is that when we have let them out to community groups. Sometimes it's only for like a six month, then they've got, they haven't got anywhere else to go to. <coughs> so then, uh, then, it, then can we have to then go and find somewhere to relocate them? So what we have tended to use is have use, use, use guardians just mainly for three months, six months, nine months. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, one of that school building, for example, the guardians have the classrooms and the hall and the bigger facilities we let for filming because they just need short-term places to do filming then they're out again so again those sort of costs, co costs mm. help cover the building costs but, but there are organ I mean, there's, there's, there's organizations like the hive in Dalston which have taken over um, uh, uh, this was the case with a commercial property yeah. uh, not a council property there's um, theatre delicatessen for example which have taken over a number of buildings uh, around london while they've been developed are you open to those kinds of organizations if they want to come to you we would consider them but obviously mm. the buildings have got to match their needs mm. absolutely but, yeah. but 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 potentially yeah um if i could turn to you now uh, uh lord kennedy what what are the what are the benefits from property guardianship as you see them do you, do you see benefits from property guardianship um, yes i think there can be benefits i mean what, what i would like to see of course is you know that it, it's um uh, at, a, at a fair and proper standard so i can see the benefits that if you've got a property there you, 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 you the property can be then looked after or protected um that it offers it can offer a, a, an alternative accommodation at a cheaper rent and i see all those benefits my my, my worry of course all these things is that it's not, that the, that, the, that the bottom end where things can be at risk, where things aren't as safe as they should be, and people are living in substandard accommodation. That, that's my worry. But I can see the benefits, and I've no, no issue with that the, per se as it is. Um, clearly, it's, a, it's a big, big, becoming a much bigger issue in London, but the, what my worry always is that it actually is this just, you know, things are done the cheap, really, and, not, not, and people are putting in poor accommodation. That's the worry. Do you, do you worry that? Part of the reason why there's been this growth is simply it's that some people see they have no choice and therefore it's not people choosing to live in that way. It's essentially forced upon them because they might not have they might not necessarily um, be able to afford to live to live elsewhere. Or, or do you think that people actively do make a choice uh, sometimes? I, th to, to I think some will actually make the choice. And it's absolutely fine. That's if they want to do that. Absolutely fine. Maybe lots of young people want to do that. But I also think other people may may be forced to into. I mean the rents now in in london are astronomical i mean i live in lewisham uh i live in a very ordinary terrace street 
uh, I pay my mortgage, I couldn't afford to pay the rents. People are charged in the same house a few doors down from me. Phenomenal rents people are paying. So I think something could be forced into this. And again, as I said, it's, it's always for me the bottom end of how people are treated. Thank you. Can I ask a couple of questions um, about the finances, just because we, we did the basics of the rights earlier on. Can I ask Stuart, maybe, to outline how the finances work on this? Because the, the, the guardians themselves are paying rent. Um, they also have to pay council tax. There's questions about business rates and the, the state, what happens when you convert a commercial property to people to live in it. Can you just sort of outline where, where the money goes and, and how property guardian companies make a profit? Yeah, sure. Um, it depends, obviously, on the property guardian company and their agreement with the client, because they're all quite different. Um, some property guardian companies will charge the client for um, the works needed to make the property habitable. Um, so if it's a derelict property, um, it will need bathing facilities, it will need um, cooking facilities, it will need places for people to sleep in and to utilise, etc. Um, it might need a whole new fire alarm system and so on. So all the compliance works are normally chargeable, well, sometimes chargeable by the client, the guardians to the client um, who owns the property. Sometimes the, the client does it themselves. It all depends on the arrangement. But that, that is something that needs to take place to make the property habitable. Um, then there are other costs such as making sure the water supply is, um, is, is you know, safe, um, check for Legionella, um, make sure the asbestos is safe and secure, not, not um, disturbed, um, also gas safety, um, electrical safety, fire safety. These are the compliance issues that need to be um, covered with costs. And then on top of that, whilst you're actually managing the property, some guardian companies will charge the client a management fee um, to protect the building depending on the length of the contract, depending on um, basically what income comes from the guardians and so forth. Some of them choose not to um, charge a management fee. Some of the guardian companies will choose to actually pay the client um, a fee to look after the building as well, um, depending on what the arrangement is. The, um, the business rates issue for commercial building um, can be mitigated depending upon where the guardians are placed. So if guardians are placed in saying 80% of the building, then 80% of the building then gets reduced uh, from the business rates from the VOA. So what happens is um, the guardians living in the property are there to secure the property. Um, so the primary use, primary use still stays as it was, i.e. an office or a school, etc. What changes is the ancillary use, which is what the guardians, when they live in the property, um, in order to protect it, they have to live there. So they have to have a residential residential part to live in basically and that becomes the ancillary use and then that gets then charged with council tax so depending on the property um, and again the arrangement of the client either the guardians will pay the council tax um, the guardian company will pay the council tax or the client will pay it but it's all all very different depending on the client um, and the arrangement and then other things such as insurance so the building insurance still needs to be um, paid for by the property owner um, obviously insurance from the guardian companies guardians and then the guardians themselves dependent on, again on the scheme they either pay their own contents insurance um, or they choose not to um, and then the guardians will pay the property guardian company a license fee to live in the property as well. Some guardian companies charge for um, administration fees, they still charge for DBS checks, credit checks, um, also fire safety packs are charged as well. Some guardian companies charge a deposit for the living space um, and it's returnable upon um, the guardian leaving the property. Um, but again, these are, a lot of arrangements at the moment are quite ad hoc, I suppose. It depends upon the arrangement of the client and the guardian company. Um, but they're the main things. Also, uh, also waste disposal as well. So the cost of paying for the waste on a commercial unit normally comes to the guardian company or the client. Um, or, or if it's council tax payable, then it's provided by the council. So just, thank you for that, that was very comprehensive. Okay. Um, just to be clear though, the, the, the fees, that the, the, the rents that the guardians pay, yeah. that mainly goes to the guardian company, yeah. it it's covers costs, but also yeah. provides the profits, doesn't usually get paid to the building owner. No. No, that's right, isn't it? From a local, I moved to Rubina now, from a local authority point of view, um, you gain by getting council tax 
for properties that are not empty, is that right? You get more, more council tax for a lived-in property than... We get council tax for properties that are straightforward residential. With the properties that are commercial, like schools or depots that they're in, there's been a problem for the past year because the VO have not been changing them. There is a, court, a case to appear in the High Court because the Valuation Office have challenged changing it a commercial property to, for residential use. So at the moment, we still have to pay business rates for the building. So that's basically w what's happening. So a normal building owner would still be paying business rates, yes, even yeah, if they the filled it with year. property guardians. That's yes. not a way out of business rates, essentially. No, we still have to pay it. That's yeah. it. Yeah. So we're not, we're not getting the rating savings that we would have liked to have got. I mean, obviously, once it's been sorted in the High Court, then they will back... If you've made all the appeals, it will then obviously be backdated retrospectively. But in the interim period, we still have to fork it out. Um, and in terms of um, the, the licence fees, I've done some research on this asking various local authorities, but in, in general and in your local authority, the council doesn't receive those. It's essentially a, the, the kind of contract you have is yeah, nil we, cost and nil payment back. We have a contract with the property guardian, and in most of the cases, they will be normally say, right, whatever the costs are, conversion, to make it to the standard that you want, you take it from the income, this is the larger buildings, and then whatever is left, we split the balance. But we, we, the main thing is to cover the costs. Then we split whatever income is there, that's in, some, in the commercial ones. In the residential ones, again, um, sometimes we have to pay back for showers to be installed if there's not enough, and then we, we get a set fee, but the guardians have to pick up their own electricity bills, their own utility bills. In the commercial ones, again, that is all part of the cost, the utility bills. So it does vary, but res generally residential, we do get m money from it. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. And finally to Stuart, um, you mentioned administration fees. Um, would they come under the letting fees ban, and would you be able to no longer charge those, do you know? Um. I think it yeah, it's similar to that, I think. I think, I mean, I've been in the guardian industry for about 12, 12 13 years now. Um, and so I remember from the start, it was originally for the processing of the document, similar to like a, yeah, similar to a letter mm. agent, I suppose. Um, and I think in the industry, I think I've seen the, the figures ready from between £70 fee for that up to about 150 I think that's what I've seen. Mm. That sounds quite similar to the letting agent yeah, industry. It's similar. I'd be interested to know if it did come under that. Well, maybe we need to find out. Oh, do I, think, you? I think they have to be tenancies to be, to be in the legislation. So if, they're, if they are licenses, then they won't. It's the same with the deposits, which don't fit under the legislation um, if they're licenses. So there's no protection for deposits that no. the property guardians well, pay either? if they're not tenancies, yeah. Okay, that's, again, that's useful to know. Thank yeah. you very much. Um, well, sorry, we must... have to provide protection yeah. is probably the, <laughs> yeah. is probably the distinction. Yeah. 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 Some, some may do. Thank you very much. Um, Tony, we, we have some questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, John, starting with you, please. How are environmental health officers dealing with the properties occupied by guardians, please? And what are your common concerns? Um, we use the main legislation, which is the Housing Act 2004, um, which identifies a number of potential hazards that can exist in the dwelling. Um, the common issue that comes up is that often the occupation of a property um, by guarding companies falls into the HMO licensing regime of the, of the Housing Act 2004, um, which places a duty that we are um, required to inspect and assess those hazards that can exist in the, in the dwelling. Uh, the common problem, the most common problem I've basically got is a lack of any proactive interaction with the companies. It, it's a case of being found rather than coming forward and, and telling us that, that, that they're making that occupation. Um, and then there is the issue about who's the person that's in control, who's managing, who's responsible. And uh, they're the common problems that we come up with. And in terms of um, resources, do you have the capacity to actually check the the properties protected by guardians. Well, we're under a legal duty to do so, so we, you know, that's what we do. It's, it's um, in terms of resources, it, that's really beyond my my ability to comment. I think 
we, we have a legal requirement to do it, and certainly in London, the authority that I work for, we, we, do, we, we do do those inspections, yes. Great, thank you. Um, and can I also ask Caroline and Jed to comment on that, please? Well, I think we agree, you know, the 2004 Act applies. I think there's some issues about some firms um, think it doesn't and might say to local authorities it doesn't apply. Um, but it does, I think. There are, we, there's an issue about who's the person in control, um, which is not quite so, well, it's not simple. Put, put yeah. it that way, you know, is it the company, the gardening company, is it the landlord, um, and who you then have to take action against if they're not um, working within the law. But I think we would agree very much I, with I, the same. I've always adopted and taken action on the, on the guardian company as the person because they take the rent and they, they mm. provide the access to the, so that they are the people that are putting the individuals into the property and they are collecting the rent, so therefore, in my opinion, they would be the persons. Um, and when I have taken enforcement action, that's on whom I've served notice. So I move on to ask, do you have any evidence uh, and concerns generally that guardians are not reporting uh, issues to their local uh, EHOs? Yeah, as, as I said before, I think the, the underlying, the, the under, underlying issue I have is the two properties I've dealt with have both been not, they've not approached us as a company and saying we, have, we are taking control of this building, um, do you want to work with us and make sure it's up to standard and it complies with the relevant legislation and I think that's the biggest issue I think myself and I, from second hand information from other colleagues, that's common across London. And do you think guardians themselves know that they can report? Um, my dealings with the, the, the two properties is uh, the first one I have very few issues from the gardens themselves, the second property, there was a, uh, it, it came about as a, as a concern from the guardian who contacted us, and then it was, became evident that it was um, being occupied in that way. Thank you. Can I ask just you to go into more detail about the kinds of problems that you find when yeah, they sure. are reported um, to you? Well, from personal experience, I've only dealt with two properties. Uh, the first one was actually... Um, very straightforward and was fine. It, it made perfect sense. It was a large HMO that was um, owned by a registered social landlord, and uh, they were they were going to redevelop it into, into residential accommodation. And there was a long period of time between um, them emptying it and then the, the, the permission being granted. So they put the guardians. Uh, a guardian company was employed to um, use the building, and that was no problem at all. It was it was purpose built. It had adequate fire heating. It was warm. It, would, it, was, it made very good sense to occupy it in that manner. Um, and we had no problems, very few problems there at all. Um, second property was an office block, and that's been slightly more problematic. Slight problem with what, sorry? It's very more problematic. It's oh. um, because it's the problem with the Housing Act is the underlying principle is that, is that it should be free from unnecessary and avoidable hazards. Okay, so essentially safe. But a building can, an office building can still, as long as it's warm and dry and has the relevant um, standards and uh, gas safety certification, fire standards, etc. It can be made to work, um, but with regard, you're kind of trying to fit a round peg into a square hole because the Housing Act was really much it was generated essentially with residential use of residential properties and not for commercial. And there are other issues regarding you know, planning consent. Is it being, you know, um, the, even if it's only been used on a very short period, is it, it's actually becoming a residential building, in my opinion. It's not being used as an office block, whatever the um, issues. It goes back to the argument about the, the, the case that was mentioned earlier about, you know, if it's a spade, it's, it's got four prongs. It's, sorry, it's a fork. It's a fork. It's not a spade. So, uh, but the problems of, um, uh, the main problem I've encountered was um, uh, basement in an office block was being used for sleeping accommodation which um, I, we resolved by serving a, a prohibition order um, saying that the basement couldn't be used for sleeping accommodation. That's, that's just like, that's against the law, that's unsafe. It's just, well, there's, yeah. no, there's no windows. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, even, you know, even prison cells have windows. So, okay, um, and you've, you've not taken action very often then? No, I've only had to do with... Um, the, the, both of those properties um, fitted the regime by licensing, so that they required an HMO license. They fitted the mandatory criteria. Um, they were over three storeys. Um, 
they had more than five occupants, more than two households, and they shared amenities, so therefore it fell in with the regime. Um, both occasions it took some discussion with the guardian companies, but they both did licence. Okay, and what about maintaining standards in places that, that you recognise don't need a, a licence? Is that... Uh, no, it doesn't matter, the standards still apply. Right. The, the, the HMO licence is, the mandatory licence is there where the criteria are met, but the legislation applies for all residential accommodation. So even if a guardian company op occupied it with just one or two individuals, they still are required under the Housing Act 2004 to meet those standards. Um, oh, sorry, Andrew. And, and, and does the turnover, of, like if these are temporarily in short-term occup occupations, does the turnover present a challenge to it's, you in identifying and then the timescale to take action? Um, it, yeah, I mean, it, it, there is um, an ability, like I said, inevitably these bu buildings tend to fall under the HMO licence regime and um, you can apply for a temporary exemption notice under the legislation. That notice is not there to avoid licensing it's where you can prove that there are circumstances that would justify the property not being licensed, such as, you know, it's a, a bedsit accommodation, you've applied to turn it into flats, it's only going to be a few months, you might then take that into consideration. But where people are, acti uh, are actively putting in tenants to reside, you can't apply that um, temporary exemption. Um, yes, it is, it is challenging. Also, the, um, it, it, it's very useful when guardians come to us and make us aware of the issues that they face because it's not something. The main concerns I have with guards is, is essentially using the legislation where it wasn't really designed to fit, which is, is, is the, the use of non-residential dwelling. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and then it becomes complicated because there is a, the issue of the managing the person in control, and then as, as, as Stuart has previously identified, the contract that that guardian company has with the building owner we're not aware of what, so it may well be that the building owner is providing the essential services. Okay, if that's the case, the issue there is that would it, the, would it be better if the contract was better constructed so that the building could be made up to standard? Or ideally, if, if we're going to go for a gold standard, should the building not be prepared up to the relevant legislation, relative legislative standards prior to occupation? And that's where it's a case of coming to us and the lack of proactive activity from guardian companies. Just uh, very quickly, once <coughs> what, on, on having suspicions that a building is being occupied, perhaps yeah. by property guardians, what powers do you have to if, if enter or yeah, to... Yeah, if, if we suspect it being a, an unlicensed HMO, we don't actually require, uh, we can go in without the landlord's consent. Um, but if we're doing, a, if we're doing an, an, um, uh, an appointment and inspection, we normally give 24 hours notice. Oh, that's but so you have the powers there to, to be if able it's, to. If, it's un, if we suspect it's unlicensed, yes. And it, does that apply to whether or not it's a commercial property or residential? Yeah, you know, obviously it's, residential. It's, if, if we believe a building meets the, the mandatory criteria for major road licensing, then we would be justified, I think, in arguing that we could go in. Yes. Thank you very much. You're relevant of its purpose. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, David has some questions now. Thank you very much. Um, Morning, and uh, I'll start with Rubina, if I can, about the London Borough of Lambeth and what you do. Um, how do you ensure that your guardian companies um, comply with minimum standards? Well, they um, normally what happens is they inspect a building, and often it's, they ask for things like the electricity certificate, gas certificate, any Legionella. If a building has already been occupied, like say, I don't know, a, a day centre and it's already functioning and we'll have all those documentations and then we try and do a straight handover so there's no void period. Um, often in the agreement the buildings are inspected every two weeks or sometimes every month. Um, any problems like roof leaks or this they're on the phone to us straight away. They, I think they have the power to spend up to £500 straight away of anything quick like an emergency, a leak or whatever. So there is a very strong working relationship between us and the Guardian Company. Mm. So any defects, either we'll get them repaired or they get them repaired. Mm. Because obviously, being a council, we have a moral responsibility mm. to make sure that whoever is in our properties are in, and <coughs> safe. And there's also regular um, fire drills and fire to alarm testing mm. to make sure that things are carried out. And there's a book, visitor's book sometimes, so anybody who's not a guardian, say, I had to go around there. I have to sign in the book 
often we have to tell them a day or so beforehand we want access to the building. Mm. So it's all booked and it's all programmed. Yes, obviously you have very good practice as, as yeah. the borough. Yeah. Um, but but uh, if things do go wrong, do you make information available to guardians on ways they can report any concerns, uh, for example, on your website or, or any other ways? Um, the contract is between us and the guardian company. Mm. We do not have any direct contact with the guardians. Mm. Um, so we don't enter into dialogue with the living mm. guardians. So, so the issue may be if, if the guardians themselves um, experience a problem, how do they know where to report things? Do, does that rely on the, the guardian company to, to inform the guardians? It, yeah, the, yeah, the guardians will have to speak to the guardian company and then the guardian company will then come back to us. Obviously, from the, the guardian's point of view, if the company are not performing in the way the guardian would then have not like it to do, then the guardian has to consider all their options. Yeah. Do, do the guardians know um, when, when they go into the property that it's a, a, a London Borough of Lambeth property, or would they not know that? Um, I think most of our guardians know it's a council, a right, council yeah. building. Is there any information on your website so that you know if guardians do have any issues, you know, is it a wider thing within the whole borough that there's someone that they can contact and talk to? Uh, no, the only information on our council website is often that we do FOI inquiries and we actually put on there how many properties are occupied by guardians, what the total income received is. We can't put addresses down because that's confidential. Um, so there, and then we put a list of which guardian companies that we use. Yeah. So we have a duty to report that. Mm. But there is nothing on our website saying to guardians, ring us if the tap's leaking or something. Okay, yeah, yeah. That have to go through. Because I said, there is no contract between us and the living guardians. Mm. They are purely there as licensees yeah. of the guardian company. Yeah. I mean, I, I know you're saying you have good practice and you check all yeah. the electricity and gas and the yeah. safety and the fire testing and everything, but it, would, is that something that you might consider, just, you know, having a section on your website to say, you know, if you are a property guardian um, and there are problems, you know, just as a general thing, contact this person or contact that person or these are your rights? Um, I'd have to take legal advice on yeah. that. Yeah, okay. Okay, thanks. Um, well, I'll, I'll move on to Lord Kennedy and ask you a question if I can. Um, the, the Housing and Planning Act 2016 includes a push to improve property conditions in the private rented sector. Um, how can we make sure guardians are also protected by these improved standards? Well, I, th I think it would be a question of is it, it should, does the law actually cover them? And if it does, then I think it's a question of is as working with local authorities to ensure that they are, they themselves are actually uh, enforcing the legislation. Um, in terms of where property gardens are, are based, I suspect it's a, a bigger issue in London than elsewhere. Mm. But and, and many things, of course, is that it'll start a period elsewhere in the country, as I'm sure. But I think it's a question of, uh, as you've heard, ensuring that the local authorities are, are, are doing the enforcement work, and also ensuring that the guardians themselves understand their rights. And you know. Uh, a lot of the websites I've looked at in terms of what, what, what property companies talk about, um, you know, you can have exciting living here, this is great, it's all new and stuff, but there's very little about, says, also your rights are this, you can expect these minimum standards from us, and if it's not the case, you can go here for some redress. Mm. So I think, there's, I think it's ensuring that people are properly informed. Yeah. The legislation may well be there, guidance there, but people often don't know what their rights are. Mm. So I think it's ensuring that, you know, through various means, people understand what their rights are, what their protections are, and they know where to go to get those enforced. Are they, are they actually covered by the ha Housing and Planning Act or, or not? Are, are, are property guardians covered by the, the protections in that law or, or are they... I think they don't, I mean, they cover for them, I don't think they're covered to have that in particular, but they are covered in particular, I think, in terms of more general respect of housing. Mm. Yeah. There's something interesting you, you said earlier, Stuart. Sometimes the... Um, the contracts have to stipulate that there's a 28-day notice period. And um, one of the issues about guardians is that sometimes they're afraid to come forward if there are problems because in the contract there's sometimes a clause that says they're not allowed to talk to the press. Now, if there was a breach of the contract and the you know, guardians were 
kicked out in three days' notice. W would that nullify the whole contract and then allow people to, to go and contact and talk to the press or, or not? Um, yeah, I, think, I think it would. I mean, I'm trying to think whether... We, I don't think we need to stipulate that, but I think some companies do obviously have mm. that clause in there. Um, and I think it only, as far as I know, because I'm not 100% sure on that, but um, mm. I think it purely applies from whilst they're in the property. Mm. Um, and I think it goes back a long time when it originally started. So something that I would probably, would, I don't think it's essential mm. to any contract for that to be in a guardian yeah. company's license. Because, I mean, for instance, as a license, um, any guardian company can end the license at any time for any mm. reason. It could, it might need, the property might not be going back. They just want that that's living space or whatever it is. So, um, but in terms of that rule sticking after, I don't think it's legally enforceable as far as I know. Oh, what? It's not legally enforceable I don't to think say so. you, you're not allowed to talk about no, it. No, it doesn't, in my opinion, it doesn't make sense because yeah. surely you should be allowed to, if the guardian company's not performing, you should be able to mm. find other recourse, you know. Yeah. D d um, Jed and uh, Professor Hunter, do you have an opinion on that as a uh, uh, I think expert? we <laughs> think they probably aren't enforceable, but mm. it, it, we don't really know that. Mm in this uh, case actually go forward but and it's really hard to know why they've been put in there mm. um and it's interesting that you don't have a view on why mm. they're there but i think they would be very difficult to enforce mm. i think that's all i can say at this point yeah. okay thank you right um yeah. just can i ask one quick question um about local authorities i think lord kennedy might be the best person to ask about this is there a, is there a conflict that between local authorities being the landlords and the enforcers. We, we've, we've definitely heard that there's a large proportion of, particularly in London, local authorities are the ones using guardians. Um, and it just seems to me like there, there may be a, a conflict there. Well, there may well be. Um, I think the authorities should manage that in terms of ensuring that they uh, champion best practice and that they are engaging companies that actually uh, are, are, are working at the highest levels here, but potentially, yes, uh, if the authority owns a building, they engage a, a property guardian company to bring people in, and then also they have the role potentially to enforce any, any issues or problems there. So I think they could have, but I hope they will take measures to ensure that that isn't the case for them as, as, as an authority. Um, John, you're, you're, you're sort of the department here we must be enforcing against. I mean, does Westminster Council have properties that you've had to inspect? Yes, right. Yes, yeah. yeah, so we, um, uh, an office office block was being used um, currently. I, I think it's due to be vacated at the end of this week. Um, the, clearly, if, if the property was being directly managed and occupied by the, the local authority, you would have no enforcement powers because the building would be exempted under the legislation. Hmm. But um, uh, it comes back to the contract. It's, you know, as, uh, as Lord Kennedy and, and, and Stuart have said, you know, a property can, a, a, a commercial property can be made perfectly usable for residential accommodation for a short bit of time, but it has to come up to those standards. And you can't use the excuse that the security of the building is allowed to subsidise substandard. Well, so it, you've subsidised the cost of the security of the building by providing substandard accommodation. If you can provide accommodation, it must meet the relevant legislation. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. That's that is that is interesting to, to think about. Um, I think we've we've identified also a problem with knowledge about rights that property guardians don't have. I mean, hopefully this investigation, the report will do, will raise some awareness amongst uh, property guardians. But can I ask um, the researchers if that's, that's an issue? Are you asking property guardians how, what awareness they have of their ability to complain? And yeah, that's a huge issue, not least also on whether they read the licence agreements themselves, because not everybody will read it cover to cover necessarily. Uh, there's an issue about who to make complaints to. That came out in particular in our forum based research where people weren't sure, particularly in cases where the property was owned by a housing association or where there was a mix of other people in there, say um, council flats that are under development where some other tenants are still in other locations in the property and some are um, occupied by property gardens, about who to make complaints about repair to. Do you contact the property owner or do you contact the property guardian company? Um, so yes, yeah, so a lot of confusion and a lot of, because it is confusing um, and difficult to get advice on easily. And when people have approached um, organisations like the Citizens Advice Bureau and others for advice. Um, that's not always been as forthcoming because it is a complicated area. Um, yeah. So I think there's a lot of guardians advising each other. 
and that's um, that sort of material going on. But it is a lot of them knowledge about their own rights, knowledge about who to make complaints to in some circumstances. That has definitely come up in our small scale work so far. Yeah, that does seem to be the stage that we're at, where, where property guardians are talking to each other and yeah. the, pro the, the problem is emerging. Yeah. Um, I can see how it's totally confusing if you're renting what was a council flat, your neighbours are tenants, you've got a property guardian company and you want to complain to the council mm -hmm. about the environmental health problems, that's who, what on earth goes on there. Can I, can I just ask, what, what, what case law is there? Is there, is there much to be uh, um, to inform us? There's very little on property guardians themselves in fact I'm not there's a case that went to the courts in Bristol about the licensed tenancy issue but only at the uh, county court level um, for various reasons it didn't go any further so there is very little um, out there at the moment so we're all sort of saying well we think it's this but um, and I think there are some things that are are quite clear but there are the bits that aren't clear and if unless it goes to the courts we won't be clear I mean this gagging clause yeah I, mean, I should imagine it's illegal to have it in a contract not just that it's not enforceable is it, isn't it well can, on what can, basis can I mean something you, in a contract you can put it in one for example for employment um, and it would be quite legal there and there are good reasons why you want might have one oh, in employment yeah, we, it's yeah. very unusual to have them in leases for example so it seems very odd to have them on um, licenses great thank you thank you great so um moving on i want to ask stuart now because i know you've been um working on something called the british standard vacant property protection services code of practice um, so can you tell us more about this um and how it how you think it might help to ensure minimum standards are met? Sure. Um, I think we, we went, I went with the, um, the BSI um, back in 2015 because at the time um, there was definitely a problem with lots of guardian companies on the marketplace who weren't adhering to any of the minimum standards um, or statutory standards, etc. Um, so, as part of the group, the vacant property protection group of um, the BSIA, um, I went went with. Um, companies who did CCTV and um, boarding and lots of other vacant property protection um, services. Um, and within that standard as well, we then start talking about guardianship. So um, it comes under a um, heading called pro uh, protection, from protection by Occupation, um, which relates to property guardianship. Um, it outlines what a property guardian is. It outlines what type of arrangement the guardian should have with a guardian company's provider and it also outlines the kind of contract a property owner should have with a property guardian company uh, and within the contract it has kind of clear stipulations of um, who who deals with say the maintenance issues it should be clear in the contract it should be clear in there um, what the minimum contract period should be um, who deals with the statutory compliance and all the things that we've discussed should all be in that contract very clearly um, between the property owner and the uh, property guardian company uh, and then on top of that it then talks about it in terms of notice periods um, in terms of monthly inspection reports or um, things that the client should be receiving as well as the standards that the guardian should be receiving so there are things in there such as heating um, hot water the basic standards um, and it was agreed upon by the BSI as well so um, it wasn't just guardian companies, it was um, external consultants, etc., who basically worked together with us to um, put the standard together. Um, and then the standard itself is now gone through another part of it where you've got the, the code of practice and then the guidance notes as well for people who look at it so they can understand what it means. So the whole thing itself um, has now um, been published and the next step would be literally to have a, a body to implement it um, for the guardian companies to adhere to. Okay, sorry, I was distracted by some committee business there. Um, can you tell us more about the association as well? That yeah, you're putting um, together? yeah, the BSIA um, is an association, so it, it consists of lots of different um, groups within the, the association. So there's, um, for instance, CCTV groups, intruder alarm groups, and so on, all about private security. Um, and the group is the Vacant Property Protection Group. 
Um, it has also people with CCTV, boarding, and so on, on empty properties only. So um, we all have discussions about the things that we need to implement for best practice on there. Um, it's, all, it's basically all about best practice for each of those um, services. Uh, and what we've been trying to do is get more property guardian companies to get involved in it, um, so then we can start working with the actual practice. Um, rather than, I know there's a, a talk of an association with guardian companies to set their own one up, but I've, we, we've been in part of that as well. But what I felt was that the standards are already written um, we just need to maybe expand upon it as we get more and more opinions on it and you, you would utilise the actual code of practice we already have and then the British Standard Association would then help, it, help us implement it across all the members of it. So any member of the BSIA should then adhere to that standard. What proportion of property guardian companies do you already have in the association? Because it strikes me that there's quite a lot of sort of startups and things that are not necessarily yeah. coming out of the security industry. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been difficult. Um, we've had, we've got, we haven't got the majority at all. We've probably got the m minority at the moment who, um, who are actually part of it. Um, we've put our feelers out to try and get other people engaged in it. Um, and I'm not sure why people aren't, haven't come to it, but it's um, something we just want to get as many as possible involved in it so then we can then roll it out properly and cover as much of the industry as we can. Will this, will this do enough to ensure there, are, there aren't any sort of, I don't know if the word cowboys is, is right, but um, given the lack of sort of law around this, there's nothing to prevent somebody coming in sort of on the yeah. side, is that? I mean, there's, there's ways of, I mean, obviously it all comes down to, it's like the SIA itself. Um, now you can't become a um, security company providing security guards unless you're SIA approved. Um, if we could get it to that level for the BSIA, then if you, can't become, if you couldn't become a property guardian company unless you are a member of the BSIA, it, that would be very useful because then obviously you can deal with the practice um, and then the cowboy companies wouldn't be able to exist. Um, and then you've got the minimum standard there. Um, and I think the problem I had with the, just the guardian companies doing it themselves is that how do we know that they're actually going to implement it? How do we know that, because obviously people within that companies within that um, property guardian association were breaking the law in terms of the notice periods they were doing less notice periods and the minimum standards they weren't adhering to but if you had a, a government a body such as the SIA or the BSIA who actually monitor that whole industry regulate it then you know anyone who wants to start the guardian company you have to have this um, this and adhere to this code of practice and the ones that are in the BSIA with you and yep. they are signed up to the standard. Yep. How, is that working? Are they adhering to the standard? As far as I know, yeah. yeah. Right, I think that's good. Can I, I want to move on to Lord Kennedy in a second, but first can I ask R Rabina, um, to what extent local authorities might have a role in, in this by, say, <laughs> insisting that, that they only employ people who work to this particular standard? Um, yeah, we're open to it. I mean, we're very, we're very happy about this Guardian Global Trading Association that's the starting up, and we're starting to say to it because we get approached all the time by Guardian companies nearly every week. Where a company can we do this? Sometimes they write to members and all the rest of it. And now we've started saying no, we want to use Guardians that are, um, you know, potential members of these associations. But you see, because we are such a large property holding organisation, our needs are instant reactive in that sometimes we may need a building boarded up one day at a day's notice. Now, a lot of these startups, even if they were on there, they can't meet our demanding, challenging needs that we have. So we tend to go for ones that have got all, meet our requirements that can do instant boarding up, that can do response, that can do CCTV, that can get a building, um, what's the word, occupied very, very quickly. So not all of them can meet our, our needs. Um, but yeah, we're happy, to, you know, we're happy to work with you know, recognised companies. We have no problem with that. Okay, so local authorities will tend to sign a sort of long-term contract with one company to, to operate on multiple buildings. Is we that the have, way it We don't have work? a long-term... One council, I think Camden Council, went out to tender, got all the companies to bid, and then they had a one provider. Yeah, we haven't done that. So we have four companies that we work with because they give them all an equal opportunity. Yeah, to basically say, well, this is the building. Obviously, from our point of view, 
we have to look at costs, we have to look at income, we have to look at expenses. So we have to look at them to at which one will give us the best value. It may be that we may have one company to do all the boarding up on that building and another company may occupy it. Yeah? So, or, so, so, so we often, we're always having like juggling between them and then obviously we do what is right for the council. So that leaves, that leaves Lambeth more flexible than a council like Camden say yeah. to things like community to argue for a building not to be occupied but, but used in like community meanwhile use and, yeah, and things. Yeah, yeah. that kind of yeah. difference that it might make. Yeah. Um, Lord Kennedy, can I ask you um, from what Stuart was saying, whether, whether legislation is going to be needed in the end to really make sure the best practice takes place? Um, <clears throat> I mean, possibly, hopefully not. Hopefully we can get to the point where actually we, the um, people will join the BSIA and, uh, you know, we actually, through peer pressure, actually get people to sign up to a code. I think the we've got the moment, I think, we actually get legislation through Parliament. You know, it's not, there isn't much space, you know, so I think we're going to have to look at how, what can we do uh, outside that, I think, at the present time. Uh, but certainly I think getting uh, companies, uh, you know, signed up to the... Uh, BSIA and work with them, it, it, it can be the way forward. Uh, I saw the ad hoc uh, property company there, their, their charter as well. I think clearly one end of this organised business is, is moving in the right direction, it's getting everybody going that way as well. Uh, the one thing I think is missing from all these things, of course, I, I said before, I think, is, is ensuring that the guardians themselves know their rights. Know their rights. And also, if their rights are being infringed, how can they take action to enforce their rights? You know, now again, I mean, I think this moment to develop is will there be a redress scheme, you know, in terms of the organs, in terms of the organisations, BSA and things, so that, you know, if, if our members don't do this, you can come here for this redress and that there's what we have in place. So I think it's, this is your, these are your rights, if they're infringed, you can go here, this is the redress scheme and those sort of things. And they hopefully can be done without legislation, just by, by, by the, uh, everybody working to actually up, up, uplift the standards in, in the industry. Is there a dress within your current um, No, not at the moment, but it's something that is actually quite interesting because it's something that could be very useful in terms of, um, obviously we spoke, we spoke a lot about the Guardians, the rights, etc. Um, and it's something that, as, as a company global, we, we do obviously look for that all the time. We give them um, multiple ways of contacting and complaining, etc. Um, but in terms of an external body, it's something that I definitely think I definitely think that could happen with the BSIA. We could implement that quite easily, I think. Um, and if that was the case, then it would give them a lot more reassurance. If I'm a guardian, I know exactly what I'm doing, and we could kind of direct them to the, the BSIA itself with like a, almost like a code of what they're going to get, basically. Um, so at the moment, what, what a lot of the guardian companies will do, they'll give them a license agreement. Um, they might have an interview with them. They might um, pre pretty much just give them the keys and kind of get on with it. But realistically there needs to be something that they know exactly what they're getting into i.e. I'm going to be on a license agreement that means um, I don't have exclusive possession etc. Um, that means I have got 28 days notice and if it's, if it's broken then it's illegal. These kind of things if they're made clear from an you know, external body as well that could be very useful um, and it's something that, that you said earlier about um, the, the local authorities like if, if it's a no local authority owned building um, and they're getting no no um, assistance from the Guardian company, there needs to be something to assist them on that. Um, I think with some of the companies that we, some of the organisations we work with, I think they do have bits on their website where you can go to, I think, um, on some of the, some of the uh, boroughs. But um, it's not a, it's not a um, industry-wide process at the moment. But I think, I think um, with BSA, yeah, you could, you could have a redress screen. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we're near the end of our um, session now. You've been very, very efficient at giving evidence, which is very good. Um, we have discussed quite a lot what local authorities might do, what the government might do in terms of legislation. Uh, we're obviously the London Assembly and we scrutinise the Mayor's work. So is there anything from any of you that you think ought to be done at a GLA level that the Mayor could do in terms of, of these standards and improving practice or improving publicity or anything like that? Yes. I, I think certainly the GLA and the Mayor, I mean, you can actually look at the, the issue we've discussed today as how can you as a body or the Mayor take some of these issues forward. Many things won't need legislation, 
Uh, and if you take a lead in those, and again, I, I suspect in terms of property guardians, the vast majority are in London at the moment, though I'm sure they'll be elsewhere as well. And if London and the, the mayor and the assembly are taking a lead and the company's engaging in that, that, that better, better fashion actually can move elsewhere in the country. That things, so I think there's a lot you could do in terms of setting standards up and working with the, the, the VSIA there have a, and local authorities to get these better, the better standards in place. Would you be able to, I don't know, look at the issue of squatting in commercial property and that sort of legislation? Because, because often when a building becomes empty before somebody even got a guardian in there, squatters go in there and they're very good at it. Then we have to go to court and it can take six weeks, two months. By the time we've got it, they've trashed it up, yeah? And it, then we have to spend a fortune cleaning it up and then to make it habitable. So whether or not, I mean, it's been done in the residential sector, whether it could be looked at in the commercial sector, I don't know. Okay, and in terms of support for local authorities is, um, or convening local authorities, these are things that the mayor quite yeah. often does. Is there something that, that you would want to see? Or? Um, I think we have a good working... I mean, we're happy with the way it works at the moment. Um, from our point of view, all we want to be able to ensure is at the end of the period we get our building back so we can do that redevelopment. Yeah. Um, is there anything anyone else would like? Have we missed anything that, that you'd like to do? Is this, uh, Assembly Member Gavron, did, did you have anything you wanted to bring to us to the meeting? Well, we got through it very quickly, I'm I afraid. I have got through it very quickly. <laughs> I'm really sorry, actually. I'm really, really sorry. I had a previous speaking engagement, so I'm very, very sorry not to be been here to hear the whole thing. I was just... I was, one of the things I... I'm not sure whether you've covered this or not, but I was interested in... in who are the people who are benefiting, this is the residential, who are benefiting from living in these properties? And how many of them can live in the property? Are there any rules about that? I know families can't, but these will presumably be single people. Who would answer that? I think the, the short answer is we don't know. It's, we don't know. To be honest, the, the, there's a huge range of the... Um, we, we've had just over 60 responses to the survey already, so not a huge number. But from what we've been looking at on our smaller initial study on about 35 tenants or so, it's a huge range of people. Because we were thinking, are oh, these millennials or so on, which is generally how um, a lot of the media reports might write at all. But actually, there's quite a range of people in there. Um, some people might live in, uh, are not necessarily single, they might be in couples and live with their partner in the property as well. So it's quite a range of people, but we still don't really know how many necessarily um, the split of properties these people are in, or much of the demographics, but it's more of a range of people than you might initially mm. assume. I see. Just because, just I was interested because, given, given how much you know the dire need for accommodation in London, you know, it's an interesting way of giving people somewhere to live. But that was that was my only follow-up because I've read the briefing and it covers so much, and I'll be able to read the transcript. Thank yeah, you. and we've got an enormous amount of research results coming through yeah. as well. Um, so I think that, that is the end of what we'd like to ask our current guests. Um, if, you, if you would like to, to leave now, you, you can. Um, we've got some more formal business to go through. And I, and I want to ask the committee a question as well. Um, we have people in the audience who've been contacting us uh, through email who would like to give us some evidence about their experiences. Um, I know some of these people, they are people who worked in sort of meanwhile uses and uh, community benefit type things that, that Tom Copley was asking about earlier on. Would it be okay if we, when we, if we can close the session with the, the current guests, let them leave and have them down for just a few minutes because we do have plenty of time, if that's all right with you. Great, we leave the webcast on and record what they say because I don't think it's evidence we've really got yet. Okay, so if you would like to, to, to go off, that would be great. Just one thing. Um, you don't have to leave, but yeah. <laughs> just just one thing, happy with that. Um, would, uh, would have been nice to have had notice of that beforehand. Yeah, so we, uh, we didn't realise until they arrived in the audience halfway through the meeting <laughs> that they were here, I'm afraid. Um, and not being aware of the agenda, they've asked to speak. And I think, it's, given we have time, I think that's, that's kind of fair enough. Um, so I'd like to welcome, um, if you'd like to come down to the, to the floor, you can come around the outside. Um, we have Pete Phoenix, who is a community worker and a housing campaigner. He's a trustee of a charity called Space Generators um, and has quite a lot of experience of working in um, meanwhile spaces and things like that and um, working in empty buildings, making community use out of them. 
which is something I'm, we're obviously focusing our Thanks a lot. Bye -bye. investigation. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. Uh, we're obviously focusing our investigation on sort of residents, but one of the alternatives is community use, I think. Informal part of the meeting. I'm going to finish the formal part of the meeting now, sure. if that's all right, yep. committee. Um, that clues that. Can I ask the committee to uh, agree the recommendations and, and note the discussion that we had today? Agreed. Um, looking at our work program, um, we've got the initial priorities for our work program for 2017-18 in paragraphs 4.1 to 4.4 of our agenda. If you can agree those. Thank you very much. Our next meeting is the 5th of October at 3.30 p.m. in committee room 5 in City Hall. Um, this is 30 minutes later than on the agenda, so please note that. Um, and there's no other urgent business. So I need to bang the gavel to close the formal part of the meeting. Can we keep the webcast on, though? Is that all right? Thank you. Okay, so that's the end of the committee. Um, so... Pete Phoenix, hello. Thank you. Oh, you haven't got a name tag, I'm afraid. But um, can you give us like, a couple of minutes intro into what you'd like to tell us today? I know you've asked to speak, and we'll ask you some questions. Okay, cool. Well, uh, thank you very much. I'm honoured that you uh, accepted some uh, input from uh, the grassroots and uh, things. Um, uh, my name's uh, Pete Phoenix. I've been campaigning basically since the 1992 Rio Earth Summit for environmental community centres to be set up in every area. Um, We've only got a couple of minutes to uh, basically go through this, but um, we need housing solutions. Um, we need a system change. Um, we need to really get lots of different groups all together talking and cooperating for you know solving the housing crisis. It is possible. Um, I'm prepared to su submit some kind of paper or something to you because obviously two minutes, I can't sum up 25 years of work in that. Um, but briefly to go over some of these points, um, buildings need to be used for community spaces. Um, we have a large network built up of 25 years of voluntary community projects. We've worked with and been approached by groups from North East, South West London, all over from Tottenham to Brixton, from Leighton to Lambert Grove, groups that are crying out for space. Community groups, mums groups, like theatre groups, business startup groups, people who want to use space for creative purposes. And time and time again, it's very, very difficult to uh, get buildings out of councils um, to, to work with them. We were nearly supposed to be given a building by Islington Council back in 96, 97. We had a letter from Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, some local guys came to us, wanted to get local kids involved with stuff rather than get into other issues and troubles and stuff. And uh, eventually, after saying they give it free to a community group, they gave it to, uh, they, they, they said they wanted a million pounds for it. Um, we've been working with the local Agenda 21 process years ago. Some of the older members of the panel were a bit more aware of that one. But basically, what we're saying is that we need to create a kind of dialogue between grassroots community groups and councils to use some of the 1.5 million empty buildings in the UK. Um, the Guardian scheme, I could say a lot on that. I'm briefly just going to say that it's an unregulated industry. Cowboy would be one way to sum it up. There's denial of tenancy rights, some standard accommodation, health and safety concerns, no proper complaints procedure. But as I draw, I'll say, I'll put this all into a proper document. There's massive concerns about the property uh, guardian and industry, and we would like a system change where we engage with you so that community groups can use empty buildings. Um, uh, I was the Hive in Dalston, uh, Respace Projects, that I was a co-founder of, showed what you can do with an empty building packing it with you know, 500, 800 different workshops, talks, events, meetings, theatre, cinema, local community groups, wedding shows, business start-up things, all different sorts. People are crying out for space. So let's work together to activate spaces. And just, I'm over my two minutes, but just to la just let's look at a case study, if you give me another minute or so, say. Um, 177 Kensal, Kensal Road, I believe, is empty. It's an empty community centre. Uh, it's a ballroom. It's a creche. It was used briefly after the Grenfell fire, I believe, for helping and supporting people. There's an urgent need for community space in the area. We've been talking to some aspects of Westminster Council through the new Space Generates charity that I've helped set up. Um, you know, why is that building being given to Camelot, I believe, 
which is going to stick in six to eight property guardians, and you're creating cultural deserts. You're creating a community space that no one can use. Yes, you get a bit of you know, uh, council tax and this and the other, but eight people are going to live in a community centre that should be used for the old people and the young people to meet together, for music production, for old-time old dance things for the old people, something for the young people, get them mixed together, create community. And we hope that if we can put a paper into you or something, we can have dialogue with all different aspects of council and government to really, I think, the strap line on the, uh, to finish with really, with the Space Generates Charity, uh, which is creating community hubs, uh, the establishment of community hubs uh, for benefit of people and planet. We want this to become a standard standard that everyone everywhere can apply from a mums group in Manchester to a pensioners group in Plymouth can approach their local authority and work with local property developers to use and utilise these spaces for helping community, for helping the environment. And we really urge the panel to really look at this and to get councils to stop working with <coughs> property um, guardian companies and start working with local community groups. And what we're aiming to do with the charity, working with a new system called Holacracy, holistic democracy and we're producing kind of uh, blueprints so that any group it can help them to set up their community project decision making processes doing all the fire health and safety and helping them to approach the council and local government so there's so much more to say but i'm happy to put a paper into you explaining the longer issues and thank you very much for listening to us and i really hope we can create solve the housing crisis work on some system change no one should be homeless this winter. Let's get the community spaces open. Thank you for listening. Are you, are you happy to answer questions yeah, for the yeah, members? Sure. You know, you, you are on the webcast, by the way. I just said the beginning. Just for advice, I think actually this is the wrong forum for you because okay. we're the housing committee. Yeah. I think, I think you, it, it would be better if we put in something to the planning committee uh, because what you're actually calling for mm -hmm. is um, the... the I mean, the, the, the best forum is for the London plan to represent that need for community spaces for new developments. I think that's a very uh, important uh, concept. Uh, I don't think there's much we can do in the housing committee because you're not saying we stick people in for homes. You're saying we want community spaces for good, for, for, which I'm, I'm, I hate to be sort of formal about this, but it's probably better going. I, I think you're right. Yeah. I mean, the remit of our investigation uh, is to look at the, um, yeah. the issues with housing rights primarily. This is, I think, one of the options that local authorities have as an alternative for their spaces. And I, I'm personally quite surprised this doesn't happen more often. Um, I know many community groups make bids for empty buildings and never, ever seem to win them. And it seems a bit yeah, like there yeah. are barriers. If you can detail for us some of the barriers that you find to engaging with authorities. Yeah, yeah. Also, to be clear, we are talking housing as well yeah. because we are linked with a housing co-op, a uh, yellow brick housing co-op. And we think that council should make it easier for co-ops to be able to get the 100% rates of mitigation and to be giving some of those buildings to co-ops rather than guardian companies and this is a, a housing issue. Idea, so it's short, short life co-ops? Yeah, absolutely. It was a major solution. Yeah. Let's no, talk think, solutions. You know. Yeah, I think we've, we've been looking at that particularly as, a, as an alternative to um, as well as the, the sort of temporary housing for people in homelessness need as mm -hmm. well. But um, like the local authority um, representative here was saying earlier, that is they're quite high standards they have to reach with the buildings in order to do mm. the latter. But I think potentially with co-ops there is an opportunity. Manchester Council last winter or two winters ago started a process of opening up their council-owned buildings for homeless groups, for other groups. It, it doesn't work in isolation. You need to have a holistic system where you support groups, you help them to do the fire, the health and safety, the, all these other things. And There's a vast untapped resource of We've seen through 25 years of community projects of plumbers, electricians, theatre creators, people who've got small business startup ideas, people, all these people sat around a community and they can't afford a space. And what we've done for our community centres is let people come in and use space over the years. And we have tried to approach councils. You know, local agenda 21 process was supposed to give us access to land, credit, cheap cost building materials, buildings. Uh, we spent a massive time in the 90s going around to. MPL Council and Mayor's meetings and this and the other and it just seemed to send us around in a big spiral and eventually I think Enfield Council gave a small local agenda 21 shop but what we need is decent large size buildings there's community centres, there's halls, there's libraries, there's hospitals, there's schools you know we shouldn't be closing any of our fire stations and community facilities we should be keeping them open you know and uh, if, you, if we work more people need to understand the system better and I'm glad that Andrew explained some of that.
you know, we need to aim for different committees and but people need to understand the process more and yeah. where they can get involved and where they can influence and hopefully our groups try and get a bit of a bridge to councils to do that you know and we showed a bit with the hive and dawson it's been packed with workshops events meetings talks cinema local groups using it, even business groups from the city coming doing it training things you know people need space and we have one and a half million empty buildings in the uk so let's visualize the situation in five ten years time where it is established as a standard that councils look for engage with their local communities and give them if there's an empty community facility work with the local groups to use it and you know and business leaders realize it makes economic sense to give these buildings they get business rates mitigation if it's taken on by a not-for-profit or a charity um, and local community groups can work with them and we really need to work on solutions and I, I was a bit shocked reading the intro to this about some of the claims from the Property Guardian industry, but I'll detail that more in my paper. And, uh, please, please, let's work on solutions and let's change the system so that everyone has a home and everyone has community facilities in the next five, ten years. We'll okay, sooner. thank you very much. Um, individual Property Guardians are also encouraged to take part in the survey that the academics are doing, which I believe is at propertyguardianresearch.co.uk. I hope I didn't get that wrong. Um, but yeah, we should, we should probably check. Right, propertyguardianresearch.co.uk. Um, anyone with experience, please feed in your evidence. And thank you, thank you, Pete. Um, oh, go, go on, one more question. Can I, can from I ask David? a couple of questions? You can. So sure. um, um, I know I, I totally agree with you about community spaces, and you know, I, I've been up to Crouch End and I yeah. visited Hornsey Arts Centre and, uh, and the Town Hall. Yeah, Hornsey, Hornsey Town Hall, yeah, and there was a fantastic community centre there with lots of community groups and lots of local start-ups using... They got in touch with us, yeah. Yeah, using, using that space. Um, in, in sort of looking into it, I think it was something that Haringey Council, their plan was you know, to, to use it short-term for, for a couple of years. Uh, and then to sell it on, and they decided mm. to sell it on to uh, a, a hotel which is you know, based in Hong Kong and sort of thing. Mm. So uh, one of the things in, the, in the, pre the discussion we had here was that the property guardian companies were saying, well, that's fantastic, but then you get these community groups get set up you know, for a year or two, but then they have to move on. And, and the reason why they... Um, you know, prefer property guardians is that, you know, you don't get these groups that they, they get all excited and then they have to move on and then they get destroyed again. But what's your thought about that? <coughs> well, when the lady said that, my, my immediate reaction and answer was there aren't the buildings to move on to because you are giving these buildings to the property guardian mm. industry. Mm. Now, if this becomes established as a standard where we actually look at so, uh, you know, a voluntary group goes in there for six months, a year, two years, whatever it is, and that rather than this cultural desert of these buildings being these amazing buildings, community facilities our forefathers, foremothers created, mm. you know, for everyone to use, churches, schools, communities, facilities. Mm. If, if the standard is established that they are offered up to local community groups with support, not just left on their own to go mm. and do it, you know, with support, then, um, you know, there will be other buildings for us to go to. Mm. Simple. Um, okay. Right. I'm really sorry. I will need to wrap this up now, I'm afraid. We're getting miles off our housing remit. I've been okay. to chair, it's reminded me. Um, <laughs> Something to do with the housing. But no, no, David, we're going to have to wrap up. I'm really okay. sorry. Right. We can talk offline, right. off, informally about this. Please do put in a paper. Um, and thank you for your patience, committee, for that. Cheers. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Really appreciate it. GLA, Chamber, Sound. GLA,